going to need a little bit of help, Haley. We're going to be in. We're just going to read Exodus chapter four, and we'll read verse twenty-two and twenty-three this morning. Oh yes, children are dismissed. I'm sorry. Thank y'all. <laughs> Praise God. I, I did want to say something else. You know, like um, there was a long time in my walk with God when I first really got saved, and I was quite the mess. And I've told this story before, but my brother-in-law Aaron, he's had a really big impact in my life. There's been times he and I we have won. We have fought tooth and nail about some things that we didn't agree on. But I gotta tell you, that brother has been a very, very, he's been inspirational in my life. I've watched him, I've watched the tears roll down his eyes in true man of God in prayer. I've watched him study the scriptures. That he's offshore today. I've watched him study the scriptures through the years. And um, but there was a time whenever we went to Cornerstone Ministries, and I've shared this before, and he was so on fire for the Lord. You remember the back in the days, huh, Ron? And uh yeah, it was, used to be fun watching you and Aaron dunk on each other back in the backyard. And uh, and, and anyway, he'd be up at the front. And I mean, he's 6'5". And Ron got him by about an inch, I think. But he, he's 6'5", and, he, and he'd just be j leaping up. I'm, I could have sworn he was going to touch the top of that church that we just had the one accord service. And I'd sit in the back because I was bound up by sin. I, had, I was a Christian, but I was bound by sin. Various types of sin. It's not important what right now, but it just ate away at my heart. I was like, look at him. What, 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 who does he think he is? What is he doing? He looks like a fool. Okay. And and I'm just trying to say that sometimes if you come to the house of God and you start feeling twisted up and you feel like the enemy's trying to like twist you up and make you feel irritated about the things of God, that's probably not the Holy Spirit. And I just want to encourage you to understand something that Surrender is a big part of walking the top, right? And so we're all look different in our personalities. We're not all loud mouth like Pastor Matt. Praise God uh, for that, right? But I just want you to know that surrender is a big, big part of letting the Holy Spirit have his way in the heart. Amen? Praise God. Well, let's read Exodus chapter 4. And we're just going to read verse 22 and 23. And then we're going to get into the message. And this is what the Lord said. Thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, let my son go that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay your son, even your Firstborn, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word, oh Lord God. We pray that it would have free course to go forward the way that you would have it to move this morning in the hearts and lives of your people. Holy Spirit, Lord God, I pray that you prepare your heart, Lord. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see, Lord. Prepare the, the, the soil of our heart to be receptive. Holy Spirit, right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you take the Holy Ghost tiller, Lord God, and that you begin to grind up the fallow ground, that crusty, hard soil that lays upon the hearts of people, pre preventing the, the seed of the gospel from penetrating the soil. Lord, I pray that you would do your work, oh Lord, and that you would, and that you would strengthen me, Lord God, and that you would flow through me, that you would just simply use me as a mouthpiece this morning to speak forth the truth of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The title of my message this morning is that you're a son, not a slave. And out of Exodus chapter 4, verses 20 through 23, we just read the, those scriptures that Moses and his wife headed back and, and also his sons. And Moses had the rod of God in his hand, amen. And, 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 and the Lord said unto Moses, when you go... And you return to Egypt, see that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I will have put in your hand. And But I will harden his heart that he shall not let the people go. And that's when you tell Pharaoh what we just read. Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, let my son go that he may serve me. And if you refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay your son, even your firstborn. So we see Moses and his wife named Zipporah, and they're traveling with their sons to head back towards Egypt because God has given Moses a message to give to Pharaoh. 
this, this is the, the precursor, if you will, to a feast known as Passover. I know that we're in the midst of the Feast of Trumpets, but the Lord put this message on my heart. And Passover was the night, I mentioned some of this Wednesday night, that God delivered his people from Egypt. Now, if you're not real familiar with the Passover night, I do want to just mention real quick, because I didn't have it in my notes, that Jesus, uh, nearly 1,400 years later, <laughs> was crucified on the Passover night. That's really profound. Okay, because every year the children of Israel were instructed for over 1,400 years to keep the Passover annually. By the way, we'll have Bible study tonight, and we're going to talk a little bit about Exodus chapter 13, which will kind of be a, 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 the next chapter after the Passover chapter, which is 12, all right? 5 o'clock if you can make it. So a, a new Pharaoh, I want you to know, had come into power because Joseph, and he didn't know Joseph. The new Pharaoh didn't know Joseph, and he enslaved the children of Israel. Uh, and his plan, and, but God had a plan. He saw the affliction. The scripture says, I see the affliction of my people, and I'm going to bring deliverance to them. And I want you to know that God sees and he hears the affliction of his people. Whenever we begin to cry out to him, sometimes it may seem like God is silent. Sometimes some of you at times of your life have said, God, I pray and I cry out and I do not. It's almost like you don't hear me. It's almost like the heavens have become brass. I got to tell you that you're not in that company. Even I was listening the other day to the scripture and the prophet Habakkuk said that. He said, I cry out to you and it's like your ears are deafened unto me. But his ears aren't deafened. That's what the enemy wants to tell you. But God is listening. But he's also waiting. What is he waiting for? He's waiting for the saturation point of surrender. God is looking for us to come to the place where we will yield our will to his will. Who is, who is going to contend with the most high? How will the clay speak to the potter? No, it doesn't work that way, my friend. The clay allows and submits itself to the hand of the potter, allows himself to be molded in the potter's hand, or else he rebels. He may rebel against the potter's hand, and he may allow himself to be hardened, but that's not God's will. So this new Pharaoh that didn't know Joseph comes and he, he, he enslaves the children of Israel and, he, and God begins to hear the sound of the affliction of his people and he has a plan of deliverance. And I want you to know that his plan of deliverance was twofold, if you will. Number one, rescue and separate the people with a lamb. Now, that's very powerful because if you'll remember, on the banks of the Jordan River, John the Baptist said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So chronologically, I want you to know 1,400 years before Jesus ever came, God was already proclaiming, I'm going to deliver my son Israel out from Egyptian bondage through a lamb. Okay? Twofold. He's going to rescue and separate his people with a lamb, but he's also going to judge the world who rejects the lamb. Exodus is the story of God's people leaving the bondage of Egypt. And the Passover focuses on the deliverance event where God saves his firstborn and judges the firstborn of Egypt. Now, I want you to know that that's going to happen. You, you understand this. This is a type and shadow of what's to come. Most people understand that we're living in the last days. If you don't believe that we're living in the last days, either number one, you don't believe the word of God. Number two, you're not saved. Or number three, you haven't gone down the Illuminati rabbit hole because you don't even have to believe in God these days to understand that we are in the last days. And everybody's getting woke to the reality of what's happening. But yet, at the same time, we find ourselves like Peter, James, and John asleep in the garden. And the Lord's saying, can you not tarry with me for one hour? Let us not be at the end of that message where Jesus said, go on and take your rest for the captors have come and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hand of sinners. Yeah. Lord, let us not be those people, but let us be awake. Let us be woke to the right thing, Christian. Yes. Amen. Let us be sober. Let us be vigilant, understanding that our adversary, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So Egypt is a type of the world. Pharaoh is a type of the devil and the enemy wants <coughs> to enslave God's people. As I've been studying these passages again, I, I think I felt like I received a little bit of a deep, a, another level of clarity. I began to see the firstborn of Egypt as a type of the firstborn in Adam. Just follow with me with this. Which is our natural birth. 
The first time we're born in Adam, the scripture teaches that we're born and it's a natural birth. Jesus and Nicodemus had a conversation in John chapter 3. There's a, there's a natural birth, but there's another birth. And so, so the firstborn of Egypt is the children of the world and they represent the first birth that we received from our father, Adam, that teaches that we were born in sin. Because Adam had sinned and his offspring now was being born in his image and likeness. Amen. And so and, but, and so also, though, that, that the firstborn of Israel, which is God's son, describes the new birth in Christ where we become the sons of God. And God delivers his firstborn, but judges Egypt. Right. God will deliver those who are born again through Christ. And he delivers them from the bondage of Satan, of whom Pharaoh is a type. At the very least, Pharaoh is a type of Antichrist. In that he is a man on earth that demands the worship of a God and enslaves God's people. The Pharaohs demanded that they be worshipped. The Caesars demanded that they be worshipped. The, the Antichrist, and, and through the power of Satan, through the years, there's been many Antichrists. The Word of God teaches us that. There's a spirit of Antichrist. And the spirit of Antichrist, is, is his whole purpose is to steal the glory of God and to steal the worship from man that belongs to God. I'm not going to even say it, but listen. When she said tune into God's frequency, because I say it so much, I'm probably going to irritate y'all. But where do, what does frequency mean to you? When you tune something into a frequency, what do you think of? She said, tune into God's frequency. Quit letting the devil speak to you. Quit letting the devil preach to you. You are letting the devil preach to you when you tune in to that other frequency. But it's just not that. It's believing the lies of the enemy. Yes. Listen, when you feel as though you're unhappy and that it's your wife's fault or your husband's fault or your job's fault or your boss's fault, those are lies. Amen. Amen. He that is in you is greater than he that's in the world. I'm not saying God doesn't want to move you on because sometimes you got some wicked bosses out there. But the Lord wants to teach you something through the endurance of a trial. Amen. 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 All right, that's not what we preach it. <laughs> so God separates his own. He judges the world. We see this truth throughout the scripture. God's word about separation and judgment. In 2 Corinthians 6, and you don't have to turn to it, but it says this. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. Touch not the unclean and I will receive you. This is New Testament truth right here. People refuse to come out from amongst the world. People refuse to be separated from the from the lies of the enemy many times because they cling to their old way of life because they want to hold on to it but not even realizing that the reason that they're so miserable is because they refuse to surrender to Jesus and they want to hold on to what they want to hold on to. I hope it's okay that I preach it to you like it's written this morning. Hallelujah. God's plan of separation for Passover was that they were to take a lamb that did not have any blemish and this is a type of the sinlessness of Jesus. No blemish. We've talked about that many times in our church on Wednesday nights. The How difficult, the arduous task of a, of a priest having to cut the animal open and inspect its insides and, and, you know, and make sure that there was no kind of scab or anything on the outside of the animal. And as soon as they saw some type of a blemish, they had to throw that one out and start all over again because the process was a type that Jesus would come from the Father upon the earth, that he would be the sinless one without any blemish. The Word of God says it in the letter to P that Peter wrote. He said that he was a lamb without blemish that was foreordained before the foundation of the earth. So this is a type of Christ. And the lamb was to be slaughtered and then roasted by fire. And fire is type of judgment. I need you to understand tonight, this morning, that Jesus took the fire of God's judgment upon himself when he went to the cross. He paid the penalty for your sin. That's the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That Jesus has already paid the penalty for all the sins of mankind. And that little illustration that I've been using is all we got to do is go to the ATM and take our faith, which is our pin number and punch it into the and receive our withdrawal of grace that Jesus has already paid for. It's been deposited in the bank for all of the world and every human being that has ever lived to be able to receive the forgiveness of Christ.
life. But if you refuse to drive to the ATM and through your faith put your PIN number in there, then you have not received your withdrawal. You don't have to continue to live bound up. You don't have to continue to live beat down and feeling frustrated. You don't. You can surrender to the message of the cross. You can allow your your flesh to be crucified. And I'll be getting into that a little bit more on Wednesday night. And you can allow your old man to die. And you can be resurrected to newness of life. And the hope and the joy of the Holy Spirit can fill your heart. And he can strengthen you. That even though you might still be going through a trial. The Holy Spirit can empower you. And give you hope. So that you don't have to continue to live the way that you've been living. That's the word of God. But many times we believe a lie instead of the truth. We gotta get past that. Quit letting the devil whisper lies in our ears. Tune in the right frequency. Amen. So the lamb, the blood was collected, and and and, and they, what they did was they applied the blood to each side of the door frame and at the top. And then they roasted the lamb, and then they went inside and they ate the lamb. And whoever believed God's word, they were instructed to paint the doors, roast the lamb, go inside and eat the roasted lamb. Exodus 12, 12, verse 10 says this, And you shall leave, let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remains of it until the morning, you shall burn with fire. Nothing of the lamb was to remain. You can't just eat the parts of Jesus that you want and leave the rest on the table. That's good. Amen. We, we must understand that Jesus gave us all for our salvation and acceptance of Jesus requires that we give our all. The father is not looking for either part-time lovers or part-time employees. We are either all in or we're not. What I mean by that is this, is that we're either saved or we're not. We've either painted the, the, the doorpost or we have not. We've either gone inside or we haven't. And then if we have... We either eat the whole lamb or we will not. Mm. I mean, you can't just read the seated in Christ scripture and ignore right. the going to the world scripture. Right. You can't just read the love scriptures and ignore the repent scriptures. Right. Right. So the doors are painted, the lambs are roasted, the people have entered inside, closed the door, and the process of eating the lamb has begun. And while the Hebrews are on the inside eating and obeying God's word, the world outside that surrounds them is being judged. You don't want to be outside the grace. Two thoughts in God's mind he wants you to know. Number one, God demands separation. It's throughout his word. Yeah. Listen, I'm not trying to... I'm done trying to beat other preachers up to try to elevate myself because it don't work. <laughs> number one, number two, I'm tired of that. But I am going to tell you this. Many preachers are scared to tell the truth about a life of separation because it starts to offend people. And when they get offended, they don't want to come back. We don't have the privilege of time to continue that. God demands separation. You don't really have to turn there, but I just want to give you a concept. Exodus chapter 4, verse 21, the Lord said unto Moses. I want you to just know right now who he's talking to. He's talking to Moses, okay? Because I'm trying to build something. In a second, I'm going to get Haley to put a scripture up there. But in verse 23, he, this is what he told Moses. Tell Pharaoh, let my son go so that he may serve me. You know... Many of y'all have heard me already say it. This has been going on for months now. The Lord's been moving in the church in a different way. And there's been times that I've been in prayer and the Holy Spirit told me specifically when I carried the cross for Mardi Gras, no matter how weird you may think I am, that was the message because the Lord told me, you tell my people, whoever they are out there that are hiding over here, wherever they're hiding, you let them know that no longer will the words from their mouth, I love you, I love you, suffice. I want my people to serve me. Yes. Pharaoh's trying to hold his people captive so that they can't serve him. You tell Pharaoh, let my son go that he may serve me. Now, this is what I want you to see. Verse 24. So I just told you, verse 23. Can you put Exodus chapter 4, verse 23 up there? So he just told, he, God just told Moses, tell Pharaoh, let my son go that he may serve me. Now look at verse 24. And it came to pass by the way in the inn that the Lord met him. And sought to kill him. Now, who is the text talking about? 
It's talking about Moses. Why? Why would you want to kill Moses, Lord? Well, we got to keep reading. Here you go. Verse 25. Then Zipporah, that's Moses' wife, took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. Verse 26. So he let him go. Then she said, A bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. Now, this is probably not the type of topic that most preachers preach on a Sunday morning, but I, hallelujah, you need to understand, circumcision is so powerful in the Old Testament. That yeah. get, get it out of your head about physically today whether a person circumcised or not. That has nothing to do with what we're talking about. This right here is it's so spiritual that if you don't see it, you'll miss it. Circumcision was a sign of the covenant that God had given to Abraham when he called Abraham out of the world. He said, come out of your father's house. I'm going to make you a great nation. Through Abraham, he had a son named Isaac. Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob's name became it was changed to Israel. Israel became the nation of Israel. Israel now is slaves in Egypt. God's about to deliver them. You get it? Whenever the scripture says that they that that Moses' sister put him in the little basket and stuck him in the little bulrushes out there, and then Pharaoh's daughter found him and said, Look, it's one of the Hebrew boys. How you reckon she knew that? He was circumcised. See, circumcision was not just a type of the covenant of, of the covenant, it was a type of separation. <laughs> Those that were circumcised, the male boys, it showed that they were different than the world around. That's right. Right? So, so what I want you to see here is that I can't really prove it, but I'm trying to reenact the visual of the story. I don't know how old the boy is. The scripture didn't tell me how old Moses' son was. But I imagine maybe, a, I don't know, I'm just making this up because I can't tell for sure. I imagine a three or four year old. And, he's, and I'm imagining he's, Moses is standing up. And I'm imagining he's holding him something like this. I don't know this for sure, but this is what, I, or he's got his legs between his legs and he's holding him like this. And then, and then Zipporah is commanded to take the knife herself and to cut off the foreskin. Now you gotta understand Zipporah was not an Israelite woman. Zipporah was a Midianite. He married a woman from another country. And then she takes that foreskin, as weird as that is, and she throws it at his feet. That, at whose feet? Moses said she's not blaming the kid for it. I, because that's what it says. It says that she took, she cut off the foreskin and cast it at his feet and said, surely a bloody husband art thou to me. <clears throat> so he let him go. And then she said, a bloody husband thou art because of of the circumcision. Now there's a couple of things I want to say about that, but I want you to know that in the New Testament there's a scripture that says this, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit. So there's a there's a fulfillment of the circumcision of the old covenant in the New Testament and the fulfillment of that circumcision and I've said it before like this is that the Holy Spirit wields the scalpel and when you surrender to him you allow him permission to come in there and like the great heart surgeon begin to cut away the flesh that's in your heart all your own desires all your own frequencies that you refuse to tune in to the frequency of the Lord and instead you demand to have it your own way that I demand to have it my own way and we sit here like Egyptian like the Hebrew slaves under the bondage of Pharaoh in the bondage of Egypt when all we have to do is release ourselves and say have your way Lord have your way, but we hunker down so many times, God's people hunker down. Oh no, I got my got my boots in the saddle, baby. I got my spurs. I'm gonna hunker down. I'm gonna tell you right now, the greatest thing that we can ever do is release surrender. and surrender. In another place, Galatians 5:24 says, They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Let our flesh be crucified, Lord. Look, I, want to, I just want to ask you this question. Could it be possible that people sitting in churches, surely not this church, right, but other churches, are like Zipporah? 
Can you imagine that? I've been over, look, we've been over here taking authority over demonic spirits. Sometimes I name them Pharaoh. Sometimes we name them Jezebel. Got a new one for you, Zipporah. <laughs> imagine this. God's doing the work of circumcising the heart. I'm talking about in another person's life. And God is doing the work of, of this. And instead of willingly submitting to the process and anger, we take it and we throw it at the feet of God. And we say, you're a bloody husband to me. You made me die to myself. You demanded that my flesh be crucified, that my, my heart be circumcised. Imagine having a conversation with the Lord of glory like that. But how many times do we as his people do that? Help us. In the story of Zipporah, Moses' wife being forced to cut off the foreskin of her son. And it should be understand, listen to me, God is about to judge the firstborn of Egypt. It's a very serious thing. If you and I walk around in our life today and we're like, mm -hmm, you're going to get yours, buddy. I don't know who Buddy is. I don't know if they don't because they don't look like you and you're at the gas pump and, and they got that music. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. And you don't like the way that they look or that they live in their life or whatever it is. And you're like, mm -hmm, Buddy, you're going to get yours. Your heart ain't right, my friend. Your heart ain't right. Judgment is not a pretty thing. I don't want nobody to be judged. Not, that, not the way the judgment is. It's an eternity. Preachers don't want to preach on hell anymore. Maybe I'll preach on it too much, or maybe I don't preach on it enough. But the Lord himself said that hell is a place where the worm doesn't die, the fire is in quench, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's going to be a day when there's no more talk. I've been saying it, Christian. The talk is going to be over one day, and it's going to be you standing in front of God, me standing in front of God, and us giving an account for our personal lives and me having to give an account as a pastor of the church. Woe is me if I have not yielded to the Lord. I believe this word. Lord, convict us. Lord, get our hearts right. Yeah. So he's about to judge Egypt. He's about to judge the world. At the same time, he's going to save his own people, the firstborn that he calls his son, which is Israel. He's about to bring judgment upon the world, and his own people are not living right. Listen. You got to understand that the right of circumcision, Moses knew, listen, I don't know what exactly Moses knew because they had been slaves in Egypt for 400 years. And I'm not trying to be weird. I'm really not, I promise. But I'm going to do it because we're talking about circumcision. I'm sorry. I'm just the kind of preacher that I just want to talk about real stuff. This church service is always going to be at least PG-13. So you're going to have to explain some things to your kids if you don't like what I say. All right? Boys pee in the woods, right? We know this about boys. When they pee outside, right? I have a hard time believing that they didn't maybe do that then. I have a hard time believing that Moses didn't realize that if he was peeing next to one of them Egyptian boys, that something was different about it. You understand what I'm saying? But I do, will tell you this, is that the word of the Lord that was passed on through oral tradition in the Hebrew people, because Moses was the first one to put the quill to the papyrus, the pen to the paper, that they put it down through oral tradition, that the people that were of the house of God were to be circumcised on the eighth day like Isaac was. Mm -hmm. Moses was circumcised on the eighth day. But Moses' boys weren't circumcised on the eighth day. Mm -hmm. So Moses is living in disobedience to the word of the Lord. Wow. God demands that his people be separated. God's about to pour judgment down on Egypt. And then the word of God says that God rolled up on him. Moses and he's about to kill him. You expect me to pour my judgment out upon the earth, upon the world, and you think that you're going to get away? He's talking to Christians, my friend. You think you're going to get away with living your life in bondage of sin? No, 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 no. I've come to set you free from sin. I've come to bring a lamb. A lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth. The Lord, listen to me. Do Christians imagine that God will wink and ignore their sin? If they're living a life of blatant and repetitive sin, whether it be sins of lust or the sin of not loving their brothers. 1 Peter 4.17 says this, for the time has come that judgment. Can you put that up there, Haley? 1 Peter 4.17 for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, comma, 
What shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Now, I know that we got a church full of Bible students. Sometimes I'm happy about that. And sometimes I don't know what to do with that. Because all of us, at one point in time, we done convinced ourselves that we got it all figured out. Come on. So you take this passage of scripture. You go home today. And you read this one and the one after it. Which explicitly states that it's connected to the world. But in this one right here. The, the, the clause after the comma. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, colon, and if it first begin at us, comma, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? What shall be the end of even, the, even if you don't believe, okay, I'm working with you here. Even if you don't believe that the clause after the comma is connected to the people of God, because I know some of you in here are already questioning. So the Holy Spirit give me a little bit of liberty like he did the Apostle Paul. Even if you don't believe that be the case, I still have the question for you. What shall the end be of them that be in the house of God that obey not the gospel of God? It's still a relevant question whether you believe that's who he's talking to or not. What will be the end of them that reject the word of God that was written to his people, called by his name, and refuse to surrender when that day comes? Lord, help us. He preached too hard, preacher. No, I don't. I don't preach hard enough. Amen. Because let me tell you something. There's coming a day when you will take your last breath here. You will take your first breath there. And wherever there is, you will stay. And you don't even have to believe it. You watch it on video. You don't even have to believe it if you don't want to. It's not going to change it. I'm telling you the truth. It's going to happen. We will all stand before the Lord. We will all stand before judgment. It will be the white throne judgment of the judgment seat of Christ. But we're all going to be judged. Help us. The Lord is merciful and long-suffering in dealing with his people. Amen? But many times, people that profess Christ refuse to get it right. He's going to judge the world. And to his people, he says, in 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16, he says this. 1 Peter 1, verse 14 through 16. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to to the former lusts in your ignorance. Are you saved this morning? No, it's a good question. I'm not asking you to raise your hand. I'm just asking you a question. Are you saved this morning? What are you talking about, preacher? I don't understand. Good, I'm glad you said that. Are you born again this morning? I don't know what that means either, preacher. Okay, well, let me tell you. And I got some of the scriptures in here, but Jesus said a man must be born again. How is a man born again? He believes in the truth of the word of God and he accepts it for his own. He invites Christ into his heart. He believes Jesus died on the cross for his sin. He asks forgiveness from the Lord. Amen. And, and he yields himself to God. When he becomes born again, he knows that he's been born again because the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of him. And now he's convicted yeah. or he feels bad when he starts to do things that are ungodly. Yeah. It doesn't mean you can't be saved and still do things that are ungodly. As a matter of fact, you can sear your conscience. And a seared conscience is the most dangerous thing on the earth for a believer because you will literally think that you're okay. And you might even believe the lie that you're because you're justified that's why you're not feeling conviction anymore, especially those of you who understand the word of God. But I'm here to tell you right now, justification does not give you a license to sin. The apostle Paul explained that to us. No, the reality of it is this, is that if we're born again, we're supposed to yield to the will of God and walk according to his word. Amen. And to serve him and not ourselves. Yes. So as obedient children, look at this. So if you're born again, if you're not born again, it's real simple right now. I'm telling you right now, before I even get done preaching, you can close your eyes and you can say, Jesus, I want you. <laughs> you don't even need me, my friend. You can just bypass the preacher and you can say in your heart, I need you, Jesus. Yes. I need you. And if you mean business with God, he will do a miracle in your heart right this second. And the miracle that you will know is that the Holy Spirit will come and live in you and you will never be the same. Yes. And or you can reject it. But you will be held accountable now. He's like, boy, I wish you wouldn't have brought me to that church today. Because <laughs> you will be accountable. Oh, no. What is the day today? 17th. 9, 17, 23, 
11.07 a.m. Servant Knight said, and you refused. You don't have to refuse. But look what he says. As obedient children, don't fashion yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. So now that you're saved, right? Now that you're saved, you're saved, right? Hallelujah. You received Christ as your Lord and Savior. The Holy Spirit has come to live in your heart. Now that you're saved, don't fashion yourselves according to the former lusts. Well, what were your former lusts? I don't even talk about your former lusts. I'll talk about mine. <laughs> I know I get, I think I'm going to quit sharing my testimony with some people. Like if I can look at them and tell they a goody, goody two shoe, I'm not going to share, but I don't mean that. If you're a goody, goody two shoe, I love you. I, just, okay. I really do love you because you probably don't have the issues in your heart and life that I had. So praise God for goody, goody two shoe. No, really. That's a good thing. I, mean, I know that. I was a bully in school. God, I'm different now. But look. <laughs> I shared my testimony with somebody recently, and I think I just shut her down after I said it. It's like, thing dude, I wasn't that bad. I don't need the Jesus you have. No, no, no. We don't need it. So when the Lord tells me I have to go back to my former loss of my flesh, he's telling me not to tune into that old frequency. <laughs> I don't know any new songs and I keep going back to it because see the old frequency made me want to live fashion my life according to the old less of my flesh I'm on a highway to hell boom boom I'm running with the devil and my friends are going to be there too I know that's two different songs <laughs> Like, no, really, the world, I think sometimes the world thinks that they're going to smoke bombs and give the devil fist bumps. Yeah, I did it for you, bro. I could go score that dude a bag of weed, man. Whoa, yeah, it's going to be so cool. And you're not even going to be cool about it. A bunch of deception, a bunch of lies, a bunch of garbage. We wonder why we can't walk in the ways of God when we're over there tuning into frequencies. And whether it's that frequency on radio or whatever it is, the frequency of the world. And it causes us to want to fashion our lives according to our previous lusts. And the word of God saying if you're born again, if you're, an obe if you're a child, you need to be an obedient child. And don't fashion yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. But as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Well, how can I live holy? I'm going to tell you. I'm glad you asked. The, Jesus, the, the Father, sent the second person of the Godhead, Jesus, the eternal Son, the eternal Word. The Word of God says he became flesh. He was without sin. He lived the perfect life. He kept the law. And then he offered his life on the cross. For your sin. Your sin was placed upon him there. Your sin was judged on him. That's why the father turned and didn't look at him. Not because of Jesus' sin. Because he had no sin. But because of your sin. Because of my sin. Matt's sin. Take yourself out of the picture if you want to. Matt's sin. I'm, my fault that God had to look away from me. But it's been painful. It's been paid for, and now the plan is that we would receive it, right? So, so that as he called us, and so now that Jesus died on the cross, it, it allows the release of the Holy Spirit to come upon the earth. And now when we put faith in Christ, it allows the Holy Spirit to move into our heart. And now as we learn the word of God and how to yield, the Holy Spirit gives us grace and strength. Yeah. In order to walk in victory. Yeah, yeah. Amen? Yeah. It's not you and I walking in victory in our yeah. own strength, yeah. doing a bunch of laws and regulations yeah. and rules yeah. and all this other kind yeah. of stuff. No, it's the Holy Spirit yeah. doing the work in us yeah. because we desire to live for God. Amen? Yeah. God went through great lengths in the Old Testament to remind his people about their relationship so that they would reverence him and not sin against him. Just some things that this is amazing to me. So so here maybe we're gonna maybe we'll calm down a little bit. But look, circumcision was a lifetime reminder that they belong to God. I mean you imagine that. I mean for a male, he's like, <clears throat> you know, he should never forget that it's a lifetime, a reminder, right? That it marked them. That they were the people of God. The Passover and other feasts were yearly reminders. No, he actually says it in Exodus chapter 12. He says, every year you're going to keep this feast. And your son one day is going to say, Father, why do we do this? 
Well, I'm glad you asked, son, because, see, God delivered us from Egypt. And so that's why we kill this lamb. That's why we roast it in fire. That's why we eat these bitter herbs. If you had to eat bitter herbs and unleavened bread with the rope, why you got to eat the bitter herbs? Because you need to remember that the world wasn't really a friend to you. You need to remember the bitterness of the previous life that you lived in and that God delivered you from. All right. So the Passover and the other feasts were yearly reminders. Look, chapter 13, every time a firstborn male animal was born, they had to kill it. And again, he says, your sons are going to ask you, why do we do this? Because God delivered us from Egypt. Every time a firstborn male human was born, they had to redeem it with silver and circumcise him on the eighth day. Every week there was a Sabbath. They would all come together, no work done, every, every Sabbath, and they would eat the meal together, and they would quote scripture, and they would remember God. There were daily sacrifices at the temple, and every time an individual sinned, he was required to offer a sacrifice. Who in the world does this? Who in the world does this? The people of God. And in the New Testament, just like the Old Testament, there are certain things that believers do. They have faith. They read his word. And when they realize that their lives aren't lining up with the word, they repent and they pray. They go to church and they fellowship with the saints. They worship the Lord together. They treat each other the way they would want to be treated. Oh, that's one right there. We can preach on that for three hours at least. Probably for the rest of our life. You know, I shared this with the church recently. I know some of y'all weren't here. And Aaron would share. He's got this big old volume of the church fathers. Uh, it's like, I don't even know how many volumes it is. And, and I believe it was Polycarp. I might be wrong. But Polycarp was a disciple of John. That's pretty cool. I mean, think about that. Here we are. We're disciples if we're learners of Christ. And, but we're 2,000 years removed. Imagine being John's disciple. So John walked with Jesus. Polycarp walked with John. And Polycarp wrote, I'm pretty sure it was Polycarp, Lord forgive me if I'm wrong, but Polycarp wrote that they would take John when he was about, Lord knows, he was in his, I don't even know how old he was, he was in his 90s when he died, for sure. And, and, and would bring him <coughs> under this, and prop him up against this tree. Now you gotta imagine, what I'm about to say, it might not affect you too much, but if you, just imagine the anointing on the Apostle John. And this is what he would say. Dear brothers, the master said that we should love one another. And they would just all just break out in tears. And then he'd bring them out there the next day towards the end. Dear brothers, the master said that we should love one another. That was the end of the service every day. <laughs> Dear brothers, the master said that we should love one another. The Holy Spirit just moved. Pretty sure that the Lord was trying to get a point across. So many times, we as the people of God are not truly loving one another. And I don't know what the definition of love that we come from. But Jesus said this, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's what Jesus said. So if we're going to love him, we're going to love, we're going to we're going to follow his will. And we're going to learn how to love other people. I mean, look, look I, I feel like I get hurt all the time. But you know what? Praise God. I remember Brad Bully. The people can say what they want. But I remember he said this one. He said, if you're going to be in ministry, you need to have a soft heart and tough skin. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm telling you, there's something true to that. Because look, if you let your heart get hard instead of your skin, yeah. you ain't going to be no good to nobody. Yeah. And I want to encourage you today. Because he's called all of us to be ministers. Yeah. That we all need to learn how to get a soft heart and tough skin. Amen. And I'm going to tell you that if you hang around long enough, I'm going to do something and say something you ain't going to like. Yeah. I just, it's just going to happen because I'm a human being. And sometimes it's going to be because your heart ain't right. Sometimes it might be because I've got the flesh. Lord, help me. I don't want to be in the flesh. I know <laughs> you've arrived, right? Although the Apostle Paul said, though I have not apprehended. Yes. Right? But he strives for it, right? All right. So, so there's New Testament believers do certain things, right? And so God proved the importance of separation from the world even more when he sent his son. And I want you to know he demands separation. That was point number one. God demands separation. Number two, I want you to know this. You are a son, not a slave. Let me say that again. You're a son, not a slave. See, God did not create Adam to be a slave. 
God created the earth for Adam, and then Adam was the image of God. Amen? We heard a great word that Friday, I believe it was, that was so powerful. That within Adam, Adam was created with the ability to reproduce after his own kind. And God pulled that, Eve, that, that rib out and created Eve. And now, before the fall, Adam has within him the ability, like the book of Genesis says, to reproduce after his own kind. And in the reproduction of his own kind, he's reproducing the image and the glory of God. Amen. And throughout the scripture, it says, my glory will fill the earth. <laughs> and so as Adam's original intent was to recreate or reproduce, not recreate, reproduce after his own image, that the image of God was going to fill the earth. But then the fall took place. And now man born in the image and likeness of Adam. That's what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 5 verse 3. That Seth was born in the image and likeness of his father Adam. And now we see the world in the midst of chaos. We see wickedness abounding in the midst of chaos. We all know all the political stuff that's been going on. All the pedophilia stuff. All, most people are not blind to any of this. And it's so much worse. The trafficking of these children is so much worse. As horrible as that is. Horrible. Horrible. Abortions. Uh, horrible. I know that. Praise God. It looks like they're, we're trying to make changes. Praise God for that. But, but in the midst of that, as horrible as that is in the physical, if you think for one second that that's accidental, I'm here to tell you right now, we are fighting a fight against, not against flesh and blood. Oh, yes, principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. I'm here to tell you that there is a methodical plan upon the earth and the enemy through the things that you see with that happen. Those childhood abductions, those abortions, that is not accidental. That is spiritual. You don't have to believe it. You don't want to. I don't care what people think about me anymore. I am done with all of that. I am not. I have. I, I know what I'm talking about because it's in the word. You don't have to go down the rabbit hole to figure it out. It's in the word. And the world is full of wickedness bearing the image of sin instead of the image of God. God's plan was not that Adam would be a slave. God's plan was that Adam would reproduce after his own kind and that the image of God would fill the earth. And it's the fall of man and the persistence in that state that prevents mankind from moving back towards his rightful place in God. God came to Moses and said, the Lord said, I surely have seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. The word taskmaster means to cause one to live under tyranny, to harass or oppress. Maybe you know somebody in this. Maybe you're in here this morning and you know someone close to you. Maybe you have been harassed under tyranny. I know people very close to me that are currently being harassed under tyranny. It's very, very painful. I can't tell you how often my eyes are filled with tears as I cry out to the Lord, as I declare, as I command, as I cry, as I plead with God. You got so many people, got so many ideas on how you're supposed to pray. All I know to do is, I don't mind it when my eyes get wet, my friend, I'll tell you that. And I'm going to hold on to the Lord till the end. But let me tell you something. They got people that are being harassed and living under tyranny. That's what the word taskmaster means. God's people were under the taskmaster. The word <coughs> affliction means to be under depression and misery. I got good news for you this morning. You don't have to be under depression and misery. This is not the same word that we discussed Wednesday. Remember we talked about affliction Wednesday for the 10 days of awe? We talked about that, afflict your soul. Yep. No, that was different. That word means to humble yourself. This word means to be under depression and misery. God wants his people called by his name to humble themselves, but he does not want his people to be under depression and misery. Amen. God wants people to humble themselves under his hand. This is what it says right here, James 4. This is another one of them scriptures. And as a preacher, it's hard to read. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. How many people living in the house of God that are double-minded? Got one foot in the house of God, got one foot in the world. <coughs> Going back and forth, doing a little two-step with the devil. And you know what? It sounds like I'm hard when I preach this, but can I tell you that I've been that way? 
And I'm not proud of it. I've been that way as a Christian. Where I had one foot in the world and one foot in the church and I was living in sin. And my conscience had become seared and I thought it was okay. That's a dangerous place to be. He said, be afflicted and mourn and weep, verse 9. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. That's the good part right there. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Acts chapter 2 says, with repentance comes refreshing. When we get our heart right and we lay that burden at the feet of the cross, at the foot of the cross, and we give it over to the Lord. Hallelujah. He brings refreshing in our heart and he makes hope enter us. He did not create humanity to be slaves to Pharaoh, Egypt, the world, and definitely not to Satan. He created us to carry his image and glory in the land, to walk in kingdom authority, to see souls saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, the sick healed, people delivered. But we can't do that while we're still living like slaves in Egypt. He said, Pharaoh, let my people go. I want you to know this morning that you're a son and not a slave. He said, Israel is my firstborn. Israel is my son. Let my son go so that he can serve me. I'm not talking about sonship right now. In the Gospel of John, listen to me. We're going to go through some scriptures. Haley, if you can help me out. John chapter 3, verse 16. We're talking about sonship. We're making a little, a little point here. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Can you go to John 3, 3 now? I, listen, I don't know who I, a preacher I recently heard. I don't know if it was Solomon. I don't know if it was that guy, Curry Blake, I went to go see. But somebody, and I'm like, I can't take credit for this. This is just too good right here. You ready? This is so good. God sowed a sun seed to reap a harvest of sons. Oh, my God. You ain't even getting that. That's okay. I'm going I'm to preach to myself. God sowed a sun seed. So that he can reap a harvest of sons. You're a son. If you're born again this morning, I don't care what you feel like. You're like, oh, I feel like I'm, a, I'm an orphan. No, you're not an orphan. You're a son of the most high God. He sowed a son seed. He sowed his son as a seed. Jesus said that if a seed abides, that it remains alone. But if it should die, it will be bring forth the harvest. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's looking for a harvest of sons. And look, the son said this in John 3, 3. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, I got to tell you that water right there is not talking about water baptism. That's my belief. It's talking about a natural birth. There's a natural birth and there's a spiritual birth. Well, what are you talking about? How is it talking about? How is water talking about? Whenever you're in amniotic fluid. Hey, I told y'all this story the other day. I had a nurse at the hospital the other day. She told me I delivered a baby in the elevator. And I was like, really? Was there a bunch of water? She's like, dude, the water gushed and just sprayed everywhere. Water and blood is all over the elevator. <laughs> Natural birth. They might not have known to call it amniotic fluid, but they knew every time a baby came out, there was water that gushed out with it. You're made of water. You're, you're in water. That's your natural birth. Yes. You must be born of, the, of natural descent. Yes. You must be born again spiritually. Yes. We are born into sonship in our second birth. Look at this. John chapter 1 verse 11. We're going to go through these scriptures real quick. He came unto his own and his own <coughs> received him not. The Jews rejected him. Right? Verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Have you believed on his name this morning? I hope you have, because if you have, you, he's given you the power to become a son of God. Verse, look at this next verse. First John chapter, first John, first John chapter three, verse one. First John chapter three, verse one. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knows us not because it knew him not. Man, I, I was seeing some other scripture that I'm going to try to break down Wednesday. I had to cut and paste it because I knew that this was going to be a long message. But this, these, some of these scriptures are just taking on a whole nother life. Called the sons of God, therefore the world knows us not because it knew him not. Maybe when we find ourselves in the company of other believers, 
and we begin to speak the truth of God's word for the way that it's written and they reject it. Maybe the reason why is, is that they don't know us because they don't know him. Yeah. Is it possible? Is all I'm trying to say. Sure. Yes. It's certainly possible. Romans 8 and 17 says this. And if children then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified. Now I'm closing with these passages of scripture. In Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Now listen, I used to love to teach this. I've taught this so many times. And it's some really kind of technical stuff. But I'm going to keep it relatively simple because I can see y'all are getting tired. Okay? But it's okay. I appreciate y'all sticking with me. This is the word of the Lord. All right? Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. We're going to look at verse 1. Because what we're talking about is being slaves. And we're talking about being set free. And we're talking about being sons. And we're talking about the sonship. And we're talking about being heirs of God. Amen? And, not, and no longer being captives, right? So look at verse 1. It says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant. That's King James. I like the new King James on this one because, you know, he says he differs nothing than a slave. So now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a slave, though he be Lord of all. So, so a person could be a son, but he's still in his infancy of his sonship. And because he does not understand who he is in the will of the Father, in his own life, or he doesn't understand what the Word of God is saying about him, he's, he, even though he has access to all of this inheritance, he's operating like a, a child because he just doesn't know any better, right? Yeah. But is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Now, that word elements right there, that is a deep, deep study, but let me make it simple for you. In the old days, the pagan nations were under the leadership of fallen angels. That's what it's talking about. Trust me, I've done hours of study on this. It's talking about the fact of the old way of doing things, the pagan nations before God created a nation where under the leadership of fall, fallen angels and demonic spirits, and most people are still living under that. And according to the Jews, under the Old Testament law, because this is a New Testament scripture, and the Apostle Paul is speaking to both Gentiles and Jews, who, if you understood the old, who Paul was talking to, I mean, y'all understand, I don't mean to get into this too technical, but look, whenever he went to Greece, you remember what he did? He got up on Mars Hill. And he went with all the philosophers. He said, I see that you're very superstitious. You're very religious because you have a statue to the unknown God. You got so all these statues to all these gods that you serve. Well, let me tell you about that one that you don't know. About. And he preaches Jesus. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is that the world that Paul was preaching to was a world that was fallen under the dominion of false gods and that the Jews were under the law. But look what he says right here in verse 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. Verse 5, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Praise God. You're no longer a slave. You're a son. Come in. You've been made worthy. Pharaoh, your enemy, doesn't want you to know that or believe that. He wants you to stay in bondage. He wants us to stay in bondage to addiction, emotional turmoil, psychological instability, false doctrine, sickness in our body that hinders us from really serving God. None of that is God's will for our lives. None of that. All right, I'm closing. Singers and musicians, come forward. We're going to close in worship, amen. We're going to worship the king. And I got